Whatever you thought you knew about the Scion brand is about to get a lot more confusing with this car. When my Scion slash Toyota slash Lexus rep contacted me to say, hey, do you want to go to our launch event for the IA and IM in Michigan? I was like, do I really want to go all the way there for a Scion? And then I thought, you know, this as a brand has kind of been all over the place. They're kind of quirky, experimental. It's a youth brand. Really, what is it? So I said, why not? Let's go. I like cars. So I went to go check it out. And this was the gem that I brought back. Now, when I say gem, I'm certainly not talking about the styling. See, Scion and Toyota kind of built this around focus groups. They built it around who their target market would be. That's first-time car buyers and people that just don't have a lot of disposable income or people that have some income but just want to dump it on consumer goods. They want the finer things in life and maybe don't want to drop a ton of money on a car. So this car is kind of styled conservatively, yet they claim it's a little edgy in the front, but uh, honestly, it, it looks pretty mainstream to me. Now, when you get to the side of this vehicle, it looks like it's inspired by a different brand. Well, that's because it is, but it's also its most interesting angle. Yes, it looks very mainstream, but it does have some character to it. Trunk space is surprisingly good. I mean, no, it's not a hatchback, but I fit all my camera gear in here. Camera cases, drone case, my sliders, my tripods, multiple tripods, my audio gear. No issue. I think for most people, as a grocery getter, your daily driving, you're gonna really appreciate this. And you know, your back seats fold down too, which helps. If you take a look at this vehicle, front, middle, and rear, the rear is kind of the most refined, most mature looking element here, but it can't escape its price point. For 16 and 17 grand, something's gotta give. But if you look at the segment as a whole, this is actually one of the most uh, mature, refined looking vehicles of its type. Welcome. We're here with the 2016 Scion IA. I thought it was a Ford. No. And then I saw Mazda underneath it, and then I saw Scion, and I'm really confused. What the hell is it? This is a Scion IA. However, it is made by Mazda in the Salamanca, Mexico plant, the same place that the Mazda 3 is now manufactured. So Scion, in all its wisdom, said they wanted a four-door small car, and they didn't want to make their own. What's the point? It's too much money. So they went to Mazda, and Mazda didn't have particularly good sales of the Mazda 2 hatchback, the previous generation, so they weren't going to sell it in the American market. So instead of selling it here, now Scion is selling the Mazda 2 as the Scion IA. You can't buy the Mazda 2 in the U.S. This is it. It's too confusing. It is too confusing. Point is, it's the Scion IA. This is kind of a global platform car. So underneath, it's very basic. Uh, it does look a little bit like the Mazda 3 under here. Just a little less robust. Uh, <laughs> strut base front suspension. Uh, you know, some attempts at aero in the front. Pretty much easy to service here. You have an access panel to get to your oh, oil look filter. At that. One bolt. Yeah. And even for your drain cock, your oil filter, all one bolt. Yep, you like that. You think Kia should study this? Next, we get to the middle of the car, and really, there's not much to look at here except some undercoating and plastic panels that you were ex very intrigued by. Mm hmm. Why? It looks just like an afterthought. I just can't believe these little gadgets have that much of an effect on the car. So We'll have to get in the wind tunnel for proper testing. What do we got back here? We have a torsion beam rear suspension. A whole lot of nothing. It's basic. Mm -hmm. But that's what you want here. I mean, really, when you're buying a car of this price range, what do you expect? This is what all the competitors do. The Fit, the Fiesta. It's not intended for going around corners. No. But what else do we got? 
You found some really cool features back here. The tool hangers and the four cup holders. Yeah, this car probably has some of the best use of cup holder design, under body cup holder design we've seen yet. I mean, what's the most we've seen? Two? Two. So Mazda is... Just don't put a foam cup because there's little studs poking through. Yeah, you're going to have to use uh, stainless steel, probably like a thermal mug for these. Or you could just have your local mechanic trim down these the there heads on go. here. That way you can just fit whatever cup you want. So this is a direct injected Sky Active motor. This is their latest generation, made it to their latest generation automatic trans. The auto and manual are equally as good. You don't have to be afraid of either. Should be very easy to service. These don't have a lot of problems. Yet. Uh, yet, right, because they're still relatively new. I did talk, you know, this goes back to that conversation. I talked to the VP of Scion about how they are managing the relationship with Mazda. And did they have any fears about bringing in a, a car that's recently new, made in Mexico, if they have any, any worries about that? And what he told me is they have a system set up well, of course, like most systems, they have a call center in California. That call center will hand off issues and problems directly to Mazda Japan, and Mazda will contact the factory directly, and Toyota actually has reps on site in Salamanca, Mexico, to deal with issues with production and quality control things. Uh, the other reason I think this is more safe is because Toyota did a really good job with the FRS and managing the relationship with Subaru. If you have an FRS, versus a BRZ, most people know if you have an FRS, you had less problems with dealerships, the TSBs came out faster, any problems with the car were addressed by Toyota faster than actually Subaru, which manufactured the car. I have more confidence and Toyota will deal with any issues here, and I'm sure Mazda does not want to piss them off. Uh, that's a pretty big customer for them, so. Most likely people that are gonna be getting this. Don't care anyways. Don't care, but it's something to note. Uh, I don't think you're going to have too many issues with it. It's a, it's a very simplistic design, easy to ma maintain and work on. What else have we got here? Anything else to note? A battery filled with pear juice. Oh, there is a pear in there. Yeah, look at that. GR35 pear. E pear. So that's like eco pear? Mm -hmm. It's more like. So when you're, instead of charging your battery, just get a pear and squeeze the juice in there. Here's the thing, people are gonna ask why even bother with a car like this. Well, the reality is if you're an enthusiast or you've been able to afford more expensive cars, not everybody can spend 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars on a mainstream car. In fact, not everybody even wants to do that. So when somebody asks, well, what's a really good cheap new car I can get without having to deal with the used market? Because dealing with the used market can be an absolute nightmare if you don't have somebody to help you or you don't know anything. So. This is why cars like this exist. To me, this is a throwback to when subcompact and compact cars were fun to drive, light, and no nonsense. And we're gonna put this in manual mode. We're gonna put this in sport mode. And we're gonna turn the traction control off and see how this little guy does on some of the turns. Right off the bat, you can tell how well they've done with the transmission programming on this car. It's really good. Holds revs, does an auto upshift for you. This car just feels so light. And that's, well, because it is. I mean, there's pretty good body control overall for a car in this segment. It just feels light on its feet. It feels just kind of really fun to drive. The 1.5 liter in here is, uh, you know, because of the weight, uh, it's actually pretty lively, and I'm not going to kid you, it, it is slow, this is not going to set the world afire, but if you're looking for a budget, like, eco car, B-segment car, it's not going to disappoint. You know, I'm behind a Civic Hybrid right now, 
and this is a really good time to talk about this, as those subcompacts grew to compacts and now they're almost like mid-sized cars, they've just grown to a proportion that is sometimes unnecessary if you're just looking for a smaller car. This car, beating on it, beating on it to death, I'm getting 37.3 miles per gallon. Now there's no doubt in my mind that you could easily get above 40 in here if you're driving like a normal person. The big surprise here is the automatic transmission. In fact, it is so good that I think a lot of manufacturers need to start understanding what they're doing here and applying it to most of their cars. Because it's funny, the cars I've been in that are almost twice the price as this or more than that, the transmissions are so slow to respond. They don't give you the manual control that this car gives you at 16, 17,000. I mean, downshifts are instantaneous almost for an automatic trans. holds revs, doesn't complain when you want to downshift. I mean, it'll even let you downshift almost to the red line. It's just a really, really good automatic transmission. I would say for a mainstream car, uh, normally I would say get the manual. And the manual in this car is Mazda 3 good. It's, it's a great manual trans, so you don't have to worry about that if you have to have a manual trans. But if you're getting an automatic, you can still have a lot of fun in here. All right, so let's take a look at these turns up here. I love that it holds revs. It's got pretty good grip from these all-season tires. I mean, nothing, you know, it's not gonna blow you away or anything, but it, it's balanced. You know, the point is here is, you know, you're gonna be driving this car for fuel economy. You're driving it, you know, somebody's gonna get this either one because they want a second car, right? This is a perfect car if you already have a sports car or you have a car that you can't drive year round. If you're looking for a new car that's that good second car that's no nonsense, this is it. Now here's the thing. Uh, there are some trade-offs with a car like this. And one of them is just kind of fit and finish in here. There are rattles in the dash, uh, like really bad rattles in the plastics and it's super annoying and it's worse when it's cold. Uh, and it only has about 2,700 miles on it. So, you know, in terms of quality, I really hope Mazda is gonna pick up their game as production increases, or maybe it's just this tester, but it's something more than likely that's gonna happen with these cars. Now, can you complain about that for the price? Well, not really, I, I actually don't mind it. You're getting a lightweight car here, you're not gonna get a, a lot of sound deadening, which leads me into the next part. This is a very noisy cabin, but it's also a very visceral cabin. And if you can just wipe your mind clean that this is a subcompact B-segment car, that it's gonna be fun to drive, light on its feet, and super fuel economy, you know, super good fuel economy, you're not gonna worry about, you know, cabin quietness and overall, because it does so many things good, from steering to brake feel to overall driving dynamics from trans to motor. You know, you can't get everything for this price. I, this, again, is a throwback to those heydays when compact and subcompact cars were really good and simple. And that, that's the, the best part about this. Ugh. Yeah, the ride quality, you know, it can be jarring. It's, again, it's not the type of car that you're getting in for luxury or road isolation. It's, you feel what you're doing. Now there's some strange things that I don't like about this car, and I don't know if it's tuning or if it's bushings or just bad fuel, but this car gets into a cycle where it's in a very rough idle in first gear. I mean, I could switch it to second. It goes away as the transi transition goes into second, back into first, but as soon as those idle that idle drops, it feels like it's idling at four or 500 RPM sometimes. It's just real rough. It, again, you know, it could just be the area, we're at a lower elevation, so you can't really blame it on that. But um, I'd be curious to see if the other cars had the same type of problem. Ah yes, the IA interior, probably one of the car's best features. 
And see, Scion is pretty open about saying they wanted to make a best-in-class or best-in-segment vehicle. And in terms of the interior, I have a lot of respect for the fact that they teamed up with Mazda on this. Because whether you like Mazda as a brand or not, they make some of the best modern interiors in multiple segments, from the Mazda 3 to the Mazda 6. I've had multiple brand product planners come up and talk about Mazda's interiors, how they're trying to copy them in their new cars. So that says a lot here. This is a combination between being in a Mazda 3 and the new MX-5. It shares a lot of those elements from fabric textures to soft and hard touch plastics. This soft touch leatherette with the stitching in the middle just kind of breaks up the plastic. Other manufacturers should use this as a benchmark, but there's definitely some issues. And a lot of it just kind of relates to Mazda's implementation of some things. The first thing that bothers me the most is there's no center armrest or an option for a center armrest. This is going to be a daily driver for somebody. It's a comfort convenience feature that you can't exclude, at least as a dealer option. The second thing is Mazda's obsession with not giving you a covered dead pedal. Your left foot's gonna rest there if you live in a winter or a place where there's snow and salt, like I do, you're gonna destroy this piece of carpet or rub a hole in it. My Mazda 3 has the same problem. I don't know why they continue to do it. It would cost them three cents to put a piece of plastic over it. This is kind of a driver-centric cockpit. The driving position is exactly like it is in the Mazda 3. You feel like you're in that car, and if you covered up this Scion badge for most people, you'd really think you're in a 3. Even the gauge cluster is lifted out of there. Well, with the exception of these cheesy blue graphics they put in the speedometer. But speaking of blue, they kind of tie all these little blue elements in here to break up the blacks. So you have blue stitching on the door hand, well, door armrest. This center uh, piece has blue stitching, and then of course your seats have this blue element too. So that's, that's actually a, a really subtle but acute element that they do here. Overall, the storage in here is actually pretty good. It's, it's what you'd expect. You got two center cup holders here and you have two bottle holders on the door and a really big center pocket for most devices. I think anything under 5.5 inches will fit in there pretty good. Uh, your HVAC controls are stupid simply laid out. There's no, you know, again, there's no digital nonsense. There's no touch capacitive controls and well, there's no auto climate control either, but you know, this is old school. You know exactly what you're doing, your temperature, your fan speed, all that is super simply laid out. Infotainment. This is kind of a pet peeve of mine on a lot of modern cars. Mazda has a really good infotainment setup. The software is Unix based. They have a quad core processor, plenty of memory. What that means for the normal person is it's super fast. Navigation's good because you have a central controller and a touch screen. So for most of your functions, you can just bop around with the actual controller and select it that way, which makes getting around much easier than having to go up here and fumble around. Uh, map software is really good. You have pinch to zoom. Your overall audio quality in here is excellent. The only gripe is how this thing is stuck up here. And we've talked to Mazda about this. There's gotta be a better way to do it. But in here, it looks even more cheap. It looks really like a Fisher Price tablet or my first tablet, as Scott says. You can see the gaps under the plastic here. It looks like you could take a screwdriver and pry this whole thing off in two seconds, which yeah, I'm sure you can anyway. But you can kind of see it looks like the ribbon cable or something that connects to the screen underneath. It, the implementation is just something that Mazda needs to work on to smooth it out, to make it look more integrated with the car. I don't typically talk about rear legroom here, but this is the type of car where people are gonna be interested in this. If you're looking at this as a commuter car, it's just you, don't even worry about it. But my driving position is pretty close to the steering wheel and I have minimal leg room back here. So unless you're a child or a really, really short person, it's probably gonna be a tight fit. So this is one of the things you're gonna to wanna to check if you're gonna go test drive this car. Since you can't carry your phone, I'm going to carry mine this no. time. You know, I, I can't get away from this. And I've stopped holding my phone, which makes it 10 times harder because it controls the damn camera, so now i got to hide it. Well, you should just get a push button. Yeah, but then I can't set my focus point with that. Well, the type of complicated shots I have, the artwork that I'm doing <laughs> here. Scott, this is your welcome back party. Mm -hmm. You weren't here for the Kia Optima. Yes, I was. Well, you were Partially. Here. You were kind of creeping in the background. Mm -hmm. Shooting basketballs in the trunk. <laughs> Couldn't get away from it. Yeah, I, know. I thought that that's what that cargo net was for. That's an option, though.
Did you, you probably wanted the one with the basketball seats in that car, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. That's too much money. It was like 45. Like they did in the BMW Z3 back in the day. Oh, yeah. That's more durable. Sure. Well, regardless, why weren't you here last week? What the hell were you doing? <laughs> I, I was here. Scott was a little shaken up. He crashed his PT Cruiser Turbo <laughs> on track. Was it's a it? prototype SRT. Oh, really? Yeah, the only one. What, did the top survive? or? No, it's, no, there's no top on it. Oh, it's just open top? Yeah. With a roll cage? Just a windshield in a cage. Oh, cool. You have to take me for a ride in that once you get it repaired. 